Good day, everyone. My name is Chris Jonas. I'm the Director of Communications with the National Association for Business Economics. NABE is the premier professional association for business economists and others who use economics in the workplace. I'm pleased to pre present today's event, which is the eighth installment of our webinar series, Perspectives on the Pandemic, featuring leading voices and economic thought leaders sharing their insight with NABE members. We want to welcome our NABE chapter members, members of the press, and others who are joining us today. If you're interested in becoming a member of NABE, please go to nave.com slash join for more information. We're gonna head straight into today's event. Uh, note that we will have Q&A open throughout the, today's, uh, today's discussion. You can submit a question to the moderator anytime using the Q&A box. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today. Uh, Mr. Carl Tannenbaum is a former NAVE president and chief economist with Northern Trust. Carl, please stand by, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, terrific, Chris, and thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And thanks for joining the ongoing pandemic uh, perspective series that NAVE has been putting on. Again, I'm Carl Tannenbaum from Northern Trust here in Chicago, and I'm really delighted at the opportunity to make this the best segment of them all because we have not one but two outstanding uh, participants with you today. Uh, both are leaders within the Federal Reserve. Both uh, became presidents of their districts in 2018. Uh, Tom Barkin from Richmond uh, became president of the Richmond Fed after a long and fulfilling career at uh, McKinsey & Company, where, among other things, he served as their chief financial officer and their chief risk officer. And Mary Daly, who is the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, assumed that role after serving as the research director of the San Francisco Fed. She has been a noted leader in research into labor market economics and has been with the Fed for more than 20 years. So. Uh, their perspective, certainly not just in general with the Fed, but also from their districts, will be great uh, to explore this afternoon. So Tom and Mary, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, the first question I think uh, we'd like to start with is that the two of you uh, certainly come to the Fed and come to your jobs with slightly different backgrounds. How has your past thinking and work informed your perspective on the current environment within the, the Fed and the economy? Tom, if you'd Tom, like to you start. start. Sure. Um, so as uh, and Carl, thanks for that nice introduction and for having us here. As Carl said, I spent 30 years at McKinsey as a consultant. I like to say, you know, my job was to try to help the people who were hiring and firing and who were setting price. And so, you know, maybe with a mandate of employment and inflation, uh, those things are relevant. Um, you know, there are places like business confidence where, you know, I was able to sit with executives and, you know, understand how they thought about investing or hiring or discretionary spending. Um, you know, when you have an issue, for example, with tariffs or supply chains, the ability to understand how businesses are actually going to think about those supply chain things. I think all those are, are helpful. I will say, um, you know, I joined uh, with full recognition that I also had a lot to learn. Uh, I've appreciated greatly. Mary and I run a little program where you know, I tell her what I think I think, and she tells me what she thinks she thinks, and we learn a lot from each other. And so I just think diversity matters in a hundred different ways, and one of them is diversity of experiences and the ability to bring those. That's what I'm trying to do. Excellent. Mary? Yeah, so as you said, I've worked at the Fed over 20 years, which mostly just makes me feel old. But one of the benefits of, of having that experience at the Fed is I, I started here in 1996, right at the beginning of the roaring 90s. And you saw the benefits of a strong labor market bringing many people in. And then you saw the, the perils of running an economy potentially beyond its capacity in the dot-com bust. And then we see the financial crisis. And so I feel like in each of those periods of time, I see the benefits of a very healthy and strong economy, and I see the cost of not having that be sustainable. And those things have really informed my, my thought process in policy making and augmented what I came in with, which is a, a labor market background, a professional experience, research experience in labor markets. And I feel like those two types of experiences help me balance out what we need to do as a Federal Reserve, as a policymaker, and also take it back to the human side of, as Tom said, when he was out talking to businesses, we have policy making that we do at the aggregate level. And it's really important we go beyond the aggregate level and actually ask businesses and community members and individuals who work for a living, you know, what are you experiencing and what's happening there? And I want to second something Tom said. I think, you know, my work, one of the things I've learned at the Fed, and it's just 
it, it's, it's completely doubled down on when I talked to Tom is that it takes all types of different experiences. That's one of the great things about the FOMC is that you look around and there are people from all different backgrounds, but together we, we get a good picture of what's going on in the economy and we actually know where we don't have enough of a picture and, and go in and look. So I think, I think those types of diversity of experiences make a big difference and Tom's exactly right. I say, here's what I'm thinking about. And he says, but what did you think about this? And I say, say the same thing and I think together we're better than the sum of our parts and that's true of the whole FOMC. Excellent. Thanks for those thoughts. The last time that uh, many NAID members were together in person was at our policy conference in February in Washington. Uh, the pandemic was really not uh, as uh, severe, obviously, then. And we heard from President Mester and Vice Chair uh, Clarida, and both of them were kind of in a wait and see mode. And then within a few weeks, uh, the Federal Reserve certainly accelerated its efforts. And I'm sure that the two of you uh, have been very, very engaged on that front. Where do you think the Fed's efforts have been particularly effective? And where do you think that there still might be work to do? And Mary, perhaps we can start with you this time. Absolutely. So where I feel the most proud of what we've done is that we acted aggressively early on. So the minute we saw that the economy was really gonna shut down, even before it shut down in a widespread way, and that the financial market dislocations were severe, we acted aggressively, took the meeting early in fact, cut the interest rate to near zero, and began opening the, now what's called the alphabet soup of facilities. But really, if you think about what those facilities are meant to do, they're meant to address this financial market dislocation and ensure that the interest rate uh, cuts that we made actually can intermediate through the economy in a way that's productive and can shore up. And it's important, I think, that we've also been saying that we're just shoring the economy up. We're not trying to stimulate the economy. That's an economy that's in shelter in place. We're trying to ensure that when we get out of this place, we are in the best position to re-engage in economic activity and grow again. At, at trend growth, meet our dual mandate goal. So I'm, I'm most proud of the, the forcefulness and the quickness, the speed of action. Carl, I think you're on mute. What do you think might, uh, President Daly, what do you think uh, might still be left to do? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's one that we all take very seriously, but the, an area where I'm specifically focusing on is that we've opened these facilities to solve these financial market dislocations, and, but we're always looking for pockets where maybe our efforts haven't fully affected the, the targeted group. And so right now, I'm really focused on this Main Street lending facility and whether or not that's getting the effectiveness that we had hoped for. You know, that's a facility targeted between the the businesses eligible for the PPP program and the ones that can't access capital markets. So that's middle market groups. And you know, the facility opened fully yesterday and I'm looking at the data, doing the outreach like we all are to see, is it being as effective as we, as we want it to be and as, as it needs to be? And I, I agree with Mary on, on all that. I might uh, add, uh, you know, there, there's still confusion, I think, in the public about what the Fed is, what the Fed does, versus, if you will, what the federal government is and does. It's probably because we have Fed in our name, I don't know. But, um, you know, a whole suite of things have been done on the monetary policy side, a whole suite of things have been done on the fiscal policy side. And, and I actually think, uh, you know, there's still work for us to do in terms of making clear, uh, you know, to the public, the uh, authorities we do and don't have, our, our facilities, our tools, what we can do and not do. I think there's still a, a lot of communication work uh, to be done. I think that'd be help us with our credibility, help us with our uh, independence. And do you think that there's more left to do? Well, unemployment's 11%, so I think yes. I mean, our mandate's very clear, and I don't think 11% unemployment is in line with our mandate. So if I could just follow up uh, on that point and primarily for President Daly. So uh, certainly if you look at the data, the take up, if you will, on many of the Fed's special lending programs has been modest compared to the total capacity. But there are those who will say that the announcement effect of the intention to participate in those areas has produced some important results. How, how do you measure the balance of effectiveness between uh, just having the presence in the marketplace and versus actually filling the allocation of credit uh, that you've committed to? Well, 
let me tell you how I think about it. And this reflects my views, of course, but the way I think of it is that we put the facilities out there to remediate financial market dislocations. And when we announce them and financial markets repair themselves and they can do the lending, that's actually a great outcome. And you saw that in the mortgage market, the commercial mortgage security market, you saw it in a variety of markets. And so I see that as that's the Fed having quite a bit of credibility when we say we're going to backstop it, things settle and markets function and that's a perfect outcome. Where you know I think there's still some question is the Main Street lending program about whether the, the low, we, we have to see what the take is, but to the take up below, one of the questions you have to ask, and we always ask this with all of our facilities is, did we do enough outreach? Do people know it's available? And are the terms the right terms to make that work? And so, and are the businesses getting the funding they need? So I think that's a facility that's so newly open that we still don't know on that one whether we will need to do more, as I mentioned. But for the other ones, I'm, I'm very much a, uh, of the mind that the announcement of our facilities helped financial markets heal themselves and the credit's getting to where it needs to go right now. Excellent. So among the most popular asset classes recently has uh, been gold and inflation protected uh, securities. Uh, and some will say that those are popular with investors because they essentially could do well in an environment where inflation is much higher than it is today. How does that concern you and what uh, inflationary or deflationary forces do you see on the horizon and how are you thinking about the evolution of inflation going forward? Uh, Tom, perhaps we can start with you. Sure. Um, we've obviously grown the balance sheet a lot and, uh, you know, through some metrics that would suggest the money supply has grown a lot as well. Um, I have to say I've gotten convinced by my team that there's just a significant difference between non-interest bearing reserves and interest bearing reserves in terms of how they're likely to get redeployed into the economy and you know, put differently the velocity of it. So I'm not actually worried that the balance sheet's going to uh, cause it, cause inflation. Um, I think you could convince yourself if you thought that the economy was going to just launch back into fine fettle, imagine a, a vaccine tomorrow, that the amount of fiscal stimulus that's been put into the economy could be inflationary. I have to say, um, you know, my base case is not that optimistic. And so I still think the amount of fiscal stimulus is being put into a situation where there's still a lot of uh, need. And part of the reason on neither case am I particularly worried is I really do think um, expectations are so anchored at this point and price setters are so convinced that the world is headed toward a low inflation world that you're just not seeing receptivity of uh, big box retailers, for example, you know, people with market power who are dealing with suppliers who might want to think about increasing prices uh, or in the consumer's mind who's you know got increased price transparency and is willing to shop for the last uh, little bit so i just think the powers that are uh, combating inflation in this environment are just so powerful that i see very little risk right now again you give me a vaccine tomorrow and we put all this extra stimulus behind it you know could we have uh, capacity challenges maybe but i just think that's a long shot at this point President Daly? So I, the way I look at it is uh, much like Tom, but let me just add a few things. So we had similar concerns, we being the, the world, basically were very worried when many central banks expended their balance sheets in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And there was a quite a bit of concern that inflation would run up. And in fact, you saw some central banks, including you know, commentary here in the United States about positioning for that possibility. But that didn't come to, to pass. And so history and the analysis has really taught us that those were worries that didn't materialize. And when you look down into that, you see some of the things that, that Tom's mentioned. And in particular, you see that right now we have a huge demand shock. I mean, we have a supply shock too, but there's an overwhelming demand shock to the economy when everybody has to shelter in place and when they can come back in only with toes in the water, not really full, fully out because of the virus. So that's going to put downward pressure on inflation. And then of course, we also have just this global decline in inflationary pressures that was going on before the the crisis of COVID emerged. I mean, we were struggling to get inflation sustainably up to, to 2%, and this was happening 
you know, across the, the globe. So I, I feel like this is a little inflation for us would be a welcome thing eventually, not something that I'm, I'm particularly worried about. And if that's not enough to soothe you though, because I know that that's not enough to soothe many, the thing that's important is we have the tools to bring inflation down. We're actually very practiced at that. We know how to do that. The, the, the thing that we're challenged with right now is how do we get inflation to sustainably achieve our target? And Tom, if I could follow up with you, uh, one of the better private sector think tanks is the McKinsey Global Institute, which has been doing some very, very good work on uh, life after COVID. And uh, one of the uh, themes that they've had is that the, the pandemic, the aftermath, will accelerate some trends that were already in place. And one of them is technology, which obviously has the potential to be disinflationary. Do you see that uh, playing out uh, either firsthand or in, in what you're, you're reading or seeing? Uh, well, I didn't know where you were going to go with the McKinsey quarterly question, and I was going to debate whether I was happy that I funded it as the CFO or not happy, but I guess I'm, <laughs> I guess I'm happy. I, I do think you're going to see more technology. I, I don't think um, that I think of it so much as deflationary as much as a risk to the labor market. Um, so maybe I would talk about that a little bit. Um, even before this downturn, I was in the middle of talking to contacts who uh, were really worried about their ability to get workers into the workforce. Um, think about a, a rural uh, grocery store chain, right, that maybe does, doesn't want to do scanners because they're not positive that their customer base is going to get excited about it, but can't find checkout clerks, and so it's going to do it. And I think if you go into a world and you say uh, businesses are going to be challenged in the revenue line and contact, at least by some portion of the population, is seen as a negative, then I think the, the incentive to put technology into you know, formerly contact uh, roles and positions will be, uh, will be strong. And I hear a lot of people talking about those investments. And then of course, you've also got distribution mix, you know, moving from offline to online retail, uh, for example. So I, I do think that technology is going to be uh, a challenge for the labor market. Uh, you know, on the inflation side, we've done a whole lot on price transparency over time. And I think that has been disinflationary. The fact that uh, you can go to a, a department store and, you know, look at the price of something and then go online and check the price against any site you want to uh, is going to keep prices uh, under control. I'm not sure I see additional disinflationary risk. Well, that's a great segue into our next question, which I'd like to ask each of you how you assess current conditions in the American labor market. And perhaps I could ask you to elaborate a little bit on first the blizzard of data that is sometimes, uh, and well, all the time it's confusing and sometimes it's contradictory. Uh, and then also, how do you see the, uh, the nascent recovery in the employment market playing out? Uh, perhaps we could start with you, President Daly. Sure. I, so the labor market is, is a complicated thing all the time and it's especially complicated right now. So the way I see it is you have to look at the whole dashboard of indicators. And when you look at the dashboard of indicators, you, you know, it's an interesting pattern that, that is both good news and, and not perhaps as good as the numbers would make you jump to. So on the good news front, what we've seen is that many ties to employers were maintained. And so when we were allowed to come out of shelter in place and we were able to go back in and as I said, put toes in the water and engage in some activity, businesses, remaining open and hear those workers back to some extent. And that's really good news. That says that some of the momentum that was there pre-COVID maintained itself and people are anxious to get back to economic activity to the limits of the virus's willingness to let us do that. So I think that's a good news. On the other side though, we, you know, this could be the staffing we need for the level of demand we have. I mean, people want to go back out and they want to go to a restaurant or a, some shop that opened just recently. But how many times do they want to do that? How much will they take on that risk? I mean, it's not, it's not the same as it was pre-COVID. We haven't found a vaccine or some mitigation strategy yet. So I'm assuming that we'll level off at some level that's not where we want it to be. It's not consistent with our mandate of full employment. The, the other thing I'll say about the labor market that really is, I think we've all emphasized, but it bears repeating and repeating is that measuring the unemployment rate itself is not a sufficient statistic for actually understanding the pain and dislocation that the labor market has experienced. Because many people went out of the labor force altogether. They're not even counted in that measure. And 
they're, you know, not even queued up to look for jobs if new jobs appear, and they certainly have broken their ties with their previous employer. So those are things that will take some time to repair when we get to a place where we can re-engage the economy fully. And so my view of the labor market is it's, it's in better shape than I thought it might be uh, when we started the shelter in place, but it's nowhere close to where we need it to be when, if we're going to achieve our, our mandated goal of full employment. Tom? I agree with all that. Um, I might add, uh, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years, we've talked a lot about uh, labor market polarization with growth at the high end, with the tech cognitive kind of jobs. But we haven't talked much. There's been a lot of growth at the low end in these service level uh, jobs. And, you know, one of the tragic things about this particular downturn is how hard it's gone after those, you know, lower level uh, service jobs. And, uh, you know, they're uh, I was looking at some data that showed uh, reduction in the labor force by industry. And in most industries, it's, it's down 7 or 10%. And a couple like grocery, it's up a little. But in leisure and hospitality, it's down 28, 29% uh, from the peak still, despite all the gains we saw last month and the month before. And so that's just an awful lot of workers who, um, uh, I agree with Mary, it, I don't believe you know, my favorite restaurants are going to be back to full staff. I don't think my favorite retailer is going to be back to full staff because I just don't think demand will be the same. And so there's a redeployment challenge in, in those folks that we really do need to take on with some vigor, whether that be, you know, credit programs at community colleges, whether that be online education. I mean, there's a lot of things we could talk about. But, you know, to get back to where we aspire to in the labor market, we're going to have to address that. Carl, may I add one more thing? Because Tom Absolutely. made a point a moment ago that I think I would like to link the two questions together. So, Tom, you pointed out that technology, you know, in a world post-COVID, is likely to replace some of the high-touch, you know, high-contact mm -hmm. jobs. And those are the individuals who are most already most negatively affected. And so it just calls into action that if we're going to do it with vigor, as, as, and I totally agree with Tom on this, we're going to need to think about how to train the individuals who were displaced by this virus and are likely to continue to be displaced by technology as we respond to the virus, retrain them and get them engaged so that they can be redeployed in economic activity. And that, that's the burden our society is carrying right now. I think that's well said. And I was going to follow up, President Daly, by noting that one of the former inhabitants of, of your office gave many inspiring speeches about labor market outcomes, not just on, on average, but in aggregate and the texture of the labor market mattering. I guess a, a follow up question might be the Fed can do a lot to try and modulate the pace of economic growth and the aggregate level of employment, but what can the Fed do in order to? address some of the issues that President Farkin noted where you have uh, skills mismatches or uh, you know, the issues of longer term unemployment. How, how can the Fed promote a more democratic, if you will, uh, set of labor market outcomes? So that's a great question and one we, I, we always get asked, honestly. And, and so here's my answer that we have a position in the society of not only ensuring that we get the economy with our tools up to its potential growth, but actually talk about the elements that create a faster potential growth rate. We have, a, we talk to many people, we gather the information and we can be spokespeople for, you know, what is going to increase potential output. I mean, that's what Tom and I were just talking about. You get, you redeploy people and you're, you get them engaged in the labor market and potential output grows. The labor force is more active. So I think of the Fed and, and I think of the role I have as not only trying, making sure that we're achieving the potential output that we have today, but actually trying to influence the pace of potential output growth tomorrow by bringing the best leaders together, having people think about it, being open and vocal about what elements could be uh, mitigating potential output growth and which ones could be boosting it. So while we don't have the toolkit, we do have the intellectual discourse that allows us to be part of the conversation and you know, not make specific policies, obviously, but let, make sure that our electorate is well informed about the things that, that contribute to positive growth and the things that hold growth back. Excellent. The two of you are on opposite ends of the country, uh, representing districts that are on, on either coast. I was going to ask each of you to offer some more local insights in what you're seeing in the local economy and how you think that might be indicative of things that are important at the national level. 
Uh, Tom, if we could start with you. Sure. Um, well, maybe I'll, I'll talk about uh, an economic angle on that and a social angle on that. Um, on the economic angle, uh, I'd say West Virginia, South Carolina, and to some extent North Carolina have opened up among the very earliest uh, of the states, Virginia, Maryland, and DC among the very latest. And so you do have a bit of a live laboratory in terms of you know, what it feels in terms of participation in the economy uh, in those states. And you know, a lot of what you read is true, that I think people being locked up for as long as they were uh, in shutdown really had a desire to get out and interact in commerce again. And so, um, you know, you can drive up and down 95 and see the differences in the outlet malls of South Carolina versus, uh, you know, Virginia, for example. Um, and, and so I think that that's a real living laboratory in terms of, uh, you know, what the recovery rate could look like. Another angle that, um, that I've just spent time on for obvious reasons over the last uh, few weeks is just to acknowledge that uh, my district, also uh, the 6th District, which is Raphael's district, that's the former cons of Confederacy. And I think there are just some unique structural uh, outcomes of that that I think we need to be digging into more and understanding more and maybe delivering a different uh, you know, message. Uh, you know, our black population is roughly twice that of the national uh, average. They're way disproportionately more in smaller towns than the national average. Um, economic inequality, if you take Rod Shetty's work, Charlotte, I think, was 50th. Uh, Raleigh was 49, 48th. Atlanta, by the way, not in my district, was 49th. But, you know, I think we've got economic mobility uh, issues. There's a long history of uh, denying credit uh, in our places. And, of course, you've got the legacy of the segregated school system, which has to do something with workforce development. Um, and so we've uh, taken our research work, and one of the things we've been spending is just understanding the uniqueness of our district. How do we reorient our, uh, our research around issues like that, which are totally within our mandate, workforce development, the performance of small towns, economic mobility in the big cities, access to credit. And, um, and so that's just the second thing is relatively unique and certainly important, especially at this time. Very interesting. Thank you. President Daly? So I'll do the same thing. I'll follow Tom's uh, model there and do an economic and a social one. So let's start with the economic. In the economic, it's, you know, the 12th district, we have the nine Western states, and it really forms a microcosm of the entire U.S. economy, if you will. And we see the range of things that, that Tom mentioned and that you can read about in the newspaper. If you're in the tech sector, you're a net beneficiary of the pandemic because you are supplying Zoom call services and telework services, and that's a rapidly growing uh, play, uh, industry. And you see San Francisco feeling like, even though we're in lockdown mostly still, you feel the vibrancy despite the fact that there's not many people in the, in the city itself. In the, in the commercial buildings anyway. So that's a, that's a part of the good news story is those industries are thriving. On the other side, we, are, we have district areas that are completely dominated by travel and tourism, by leisure. And those areas are decimated, essentially. All activity that they rely on is stopped. People are not traveling to Hawaii. They're not really traveling. They started out in a, in a large number the day the casinos opened in Las Vegas, but that really stopped short when people realize they have to get on planes and sit literally right next to each other. And it's just, these are things where you see the, the lens, through the lens of the pandemic, you learn that the disease itself is indiscriminate. It, if it infects all of us, you know, the chances aren't different, but the impact of the disease on the economic life is vastly different depending on what type of industry you are in and where, what job you hold specifically. So that's, that's a helpful thing to remember. On the social side, you know, while we're not in the Confederacy, I do live in Oakland and I do serve an area which is highly diverse in terms of a variety of, we have an African-American population, a Latinx population, we have a number of immigrants who have come in to live here in our district. And in Oakland, that's a, that's a microcosm of the whole district where I live. And what you see is that there's an awareness that the atomistic approaches we've been taking to you know, providing credit or growing an inclusive economy for the labor market or getting more uh, affordable housing, it really is, the call to action is that we need to think of it more as an ecosystem and we need to think about how communities thrive and we need to take that 
uh, seriously. And so I'm, I'm talking, I spend a lot of my time trying to revisit these issues and ask where, where can research help us here? You know, research is important in all of this, but we're going to have to break down the silos of research across disciplines so that researchers can communicate better with each other and really go after these problems as an ecosystem if we're going to deliver on the promise of a more inclusive economy. And I certainly feel that here in, in, the, in the West. I think as, as one who used to work at the Fed, one of the things that really was remarkable when I got there is the engagement that each of the district banks has with its community and broader objectives than just, uh, you know, what interest rates should be. And I'm, I'm glad that the two of you were able to illustrate that for those listening today. Uh, one of the other things I worked on when I was at the Fed was the stress test, which uh, has become the, the bane of my existence now I'm back in the private sector. But the results were released a couple of weeks ago. And uh, there was good news and bad news. Uh, the outcomes give, uh, for the scenarios that uh, were used uh, for the test uh, announced by the Fed in, in early February uh, found uh, all of the banks uh, relatively well capitalized and in the, in the industry as a whole looking very solid. The bad news was is that obviously the scenarios that were released earlier in the year did not reflect the pandemic and the Fed took the initiative of studying uh, three different versions of a pandemic scenarios which did uh, indicate some increasing stress on at least a handful of the banks in the sample. And all of us have been asked uh, to resubmit our plans, uh, which I wasn't going to have a summer vacation anyway, so I'm not uh, bitter about it. But how do you assess uh, with all of that input that you're getting from uh, the, the supervision regulation department, the health of the American banking system? And are there challenges that you'd like bankers to be especially vigilant about? I'm glad to start. Uh, I mean, uh, I took great comfort out of those stress tests. The uh, toughest scenarios, in particular the W scenario, was a pretty ugly scenario. And if you go back even uh, the last couple of years and looked at what we thought at the time were very ugly stress test scenarios, this was even tougher. And reality has proven even tougher. So, you know, the fact that the banks uh, came through those assessments uh, with sufficient capital, I think that's very uh, reassuring. Um, you know, but I think you never stop and declare victory. I think there's a world out there that's very uncertain and we've gotta be focused on it. Um, you know, I, I do think there's an air pocket out there, my phrase, air pocket. You know, there is loan forbearance uh, is gonna expire, you know, uh, somewhere around now for a set of loans and somewhere around three months from now for another set of loans. And what will be the payment behaviors of those who've had the loans for born that's an unknown and I think something to pay a lot of attention to. Um, there's been a ton of stimulus, fis fiscal stimulus put into the economy into the hands of the least advantaged and I don't know if there'll be more voted on in the next couple weeks or so but if there's not you know how will you know when we start seeing the effects of double digit unemployment rate in terms of people's ability to to repay that will matter. The PPP uh, is expiring as we speak. So there's a bunch of small businesses out there, unless there's more stimulus put there, who are going to have to face, I think, more clearly the circumstance they're in. And as I think we both suggested, you know, demand is going to take a while to come back. So, you know, I, I think uh, constant vigil, you know, it's great that we have seen what we've seen, but I think we've got to stay very vigilant in the context of some very real risks that are coming. President Taylor? Uh I would agree with with all of those things that Tom uh, pointed to. I mean, it, just to say them again, really, because they're so important, is that the, the financial system was in good shape, really solid foot on solid footing prior to the crisis, and this is the COVID crisis, and this has really helped us. It's why the stress test came out in the positive way that you mentioned in terms of the capital on hand today. But we're just at the beginning stages of this. That's what it looks like. We don't know how long it will take to fully put the virus behind us, when we'll get a vaccine or a full-blown therapeutic mitigation strategy. So with that in mind, there's this uncertainty about how much more damage will the economy suffer. And you know, Tom uh, itemized things that can happen. Forbearance can turn into default. 
uh, people who were getting support shored up and now are getting less support as these programs could roll off if they're not renewed, then those individuals, you know, they have trouble paying rent. And if, if you have trouble paying rent, then the landlord of the building you rent in has trouble paying back the, the business, the bank, and then the bank gets into a, a bad asset, bad debt. And those types of things can accumulate. So that's why banks are being asked to resubmit their capital plans and, and be aware of that and really hold on to capital. You know, the, the supervisors have a, a saying that they, they like to, to use, which is the cheapest capital you can get is the capital you have. And I, and I think uh, capital preservation on the part of banks so that they can be in, continue to be in a good place as the virus unfolds and we understand more about what the economic shocks really look like and how persistent they are. So we're both, we're uncertain about two things and that's always hard. We're under, un, uncertain about magnitude and we're uncertain about duration. And since both of those are true, then being in a um, risk posture that says, things can get worse or they could stay this bad for a while is important. I think for all of us, uh, it goes back to something a fighter pilot friend of mine taught me, uh, hope for the best, prepare for less than the best. Okay, thank you for that metaphor. Uh, <laughs> let me ask each of you to just follow up. Uh, give me the credit sector in a moment that you're perhaps more concerned about than, than others. President Daly? Well, I think right now where people I'm talking to a lot are, are and, and they're worried, are groups that own commercial real estate. Commercial real estates, whether they're retail commercial real estate holders or, you know, properties like office spaces, they're worried because, you know, we've had uh, big companies out here in the West announce that they're never going to bring their people back to work. And for a place like San Francisco, that's going to be a big deal if tech companies decide that remote work is the new way. Now, I'm a little skeptical about whether new remote work is the new way forever, but certainly more remote work will be there and people will rethink, businesses will rethink. And then of course, there are retail groups that are just filing for bankruptcy and things. And so all of that space is going to be more available than it was. And so those that commercial real estate sector is one I, I really pay a lot of attention to right now because it might be the first place where we really start to see these forbearances translating into defaults that translate into real hardships for both the holders of the loans and uh, the holders of the buildings. Excellent. Tom? I agree completely on real estate, particularly retail, um, uh, or even retail that isn't anchored by a Walmart, a Home Depot, you know, a Target, one of the winners uh, in this environment. And, and then I would add, you know, uh, highly leveraged corporate debt. All right. Uh, I'm now going to trans, trans uh, uh, what's the word I want? I'm going to uh, uh, move over to some of the questions that we've gotten from the audience. Sorry, my vocabulary is my daughter's been studying for the GRE, so my vocabulary uh, has been <laughs> tested. Um, uh, several questions kind of strike at this, at, at this theme. The collaboration uh, between the Treasury and the Federal Reserve has been very, very strong during the initial months of the pandemic. Um, there are some questions, though, as to whether that has uh, somehow compromised the independence of the Federal Reserve. And a couple of questions kind of strike at, will there come a day, as there did in, I think it was 1953, where the Treasury and the Fed have to sort of disengage with one another and, and how difficult will that be to do? Uh, Tom, can we start with you? Well, I think there has been good collaboration on these facilities and I would just, you know, uh, make the point, which I don't know that I would have uh, projected 10 years ago, that I think Dodd-Frank has really helped. I mean, uh, I think the swim lanes have gotten extremely clear. We know what we're supposed to do. We know what authorities we have. We know what authorities we don't have. Uh, the American public through Congress has decided what authorities Treasury should have and, and we should have. And so, you know, at least I'd say in terms of knowing the playbook, who calls the plays, who delivers, I think that's actually played out very nicely. And I think that's how it was designed and how it should work. Um, I don't really think there's been the kind of collaboration you're talking about, though, on the monetary policy. And I think we're doing monetary policy independent as we're chartered to do. And, you know, we're trying to lay it out there. I, um, I've read uh, a book on the 1951 Treasury uh, Fed Accord. It's quite a 
drama for those who are interested. And I just say, I personally don't have any interest in going back to a place where, you know, you try to control markets in a way that means you have to have a divorce at the end. It's just too, it's just too painful. President Daly? Yeah, I would second those things. I mean, I think we've, we've learned, our history has taught us something in, in the collaboration we've had on the 13-3 facilities in particular. That's where the collaboration between Treasury and, and the Board of Governors has been, and that's been successful. And, and, you know, I think for the American public, in terms of independence, when they see Chair Powell and, and uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin testify, you know, but uh, on different swim lanes, as Tom said, but together, I think that really helps. It's just that they, they, we each have our roles to play on these things and we're, we're doing our parts. And I, and I want to uh, double down in emphasis on something Tom said, which is that on the monetary policy side, on the funds rate adjustment and how we think about what we're doing in terms of forward guidance and all the things we deliberate as an FOMC, those are completely independent of anything with the Treasury. The Treasury collaboration with us has been on the 13-3 facilities, as Dodd-Frank laid out, and clearly demarcated lines of who does what and, and, and and when essentially the one thing i will add though that you know you think about our independence like tom mentioned this early on in our meeting and i want to bring it back communication ongoing communication about these swing lines about what we're doing and the transparency of those things i think is really important and we need to do that and continue to do that and have conversations like these where we say they're clearly demarcated lines and here's what we're doing and here's who's doing it I'm in Norfolk today, did a, uh, a webinar with the uh, local chamber, and I got several questions about, you know, why don't you guys redo the PPP so that it yes. better suits my needs? Well, you know, the PPP was done by Congress and the Small Business Administration. Other than a liquidity facility, we're not engaged in it. But that's the kind of confusion I think we're going to struggle with. All right, thank you. Uh, Several questions are in the arena of trade. This, of course, has not just been an affliction of, uh, of American citizens, both the pandemic and its consequences economically are very much global issues. Uh, the questions, many of them are focused on, on China, of course, not just because it, uh, in, in most tellings, is the origin of the coronavirus itself, but also because of the aftermath and, and some of the issues that uh, companies are having with, with trade with China and, and maybe reevaluating it. Perhaps we could start with President Daly, as so many uh, businesses in your district uh, do have direct trade ties with China. How do you see the trade environment and the political environment in, uh, evolving with China? And do you think that there might be some trend towards reshoring that brings uh, more business closer to the United States? Well, that's a, it's super interesting. And as you noted, it predates COVID, really. We were having trade the negotiations, uh, wars, depending on who you're talking to. And these were causing big companies and small companies to think about, you know, not just waiting for that negotiation to take place, but asking where do they need to go instead of China? Where can they go in addition to China? So often it's not instead of, it's in addition to, and it's moving supply chains to different places. And you know, I've talked to my contacts who have business uh, linkages in China and across the globe, and they always really say the same thing, that they're taking more of a portfolio approach to their supply chain. You, know, you used to have an idea that you went to the lowest cost provider and you didn't need um, you know, duplication, essentially. And now they're realizing that duplication matters because not only can one country start having trade issues with another country, but now we know that the virus could hit, and especially now, the virus could hit one locality and another locality still is up and running. And that changing geography has just made them double down on this idea that uh, a diverse supply chain is a healthy supply chain. Now, one thing that I'm not hearing, and you, you mentioned it, so I wanted to note it, I'm not hearing about redeployment of those businesses onto U.S. Uh, property. It's not that we're going to bring it all home. That's not what they're doing. It's that we're going to put it elsewhere across the globe. And so I think it doesn't mean that nothing will come back, but it does mean that things won't, we're not going to have a mass, at least according to my contacts, we're not going to have a massive relocation to the U.S. It's really just about the diversity of supply chains, whether that's across the country or across the globe. Thank you, um, Tom. Totally agree on the diversification. Um, uh, if you didn't believe it beforehand, 
the notion of you know putting all of your supply chain in just one country when you've got virus risk and political risk feels like a idea that one wonders why one ever had it five years ago. Um, uh, I would say that moving uh, operations out of China is a lot harder than it looks. Um, it's a lot harder because actually there's some very real reasons people put their operations in China, uh, especially in things like precision manufacturing, where they're really quite good at it and quite cheap. And so there's a competitive dynamic that companies really struggle with. Um, if they move and others don't, and this thing all settles down, are they going to be at a competitive disadvantage? Um, you know, uh, starting another plant in another country is costly and it's slow. I mean, it's years before that's able to produce at the productivity and at the efficiency that you were beforehand. And again, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Um, now, all that said, uh, if you didn't believe the trade thing was going to last, then just add to it COVID. And so I do believe at this point, the folks I talked to, as Mary said, they've sort of said, okay, this is crazy. I can't just stay in one place. I've got to you know, bite the bullet and do it. Um, I agree, they're not moving it back to the US. I hear a lot about Mexico. In the apparel, you hear a lot about Vietnam or Indonesia or Malaysia, but in manufacturing, you hear a lot about Mexico. Uh, and I just come back to, if it wasn't competitive to make it domestically beforehand, and you have competitors who are not gonna be there, then it's really hard to manufacture domestically. The exceptions might be places like healthcare. Easy for me to imagine that mm -hmm. we'll put, there will be mandates coming out of this to have a certain amount of our healthcare supply just like our national defense supply manufactured locally. And if an entire industry is mandated to do it, then an entire industry will come on shore. I mean, that, again, I just would bow to this competitive, uh, this competitive dynamic. I've got another couple of questions that center on uh, state and local government. I don't know whether to be proud or ashamed that the state of Illinois was the first borrower from the Fed's municipal lending facility uh, potentially because we're one of the few states where the borrowing costs were well far below what we could raise in the markets, but uh, we'll leave that aside. How are you seeing uh, the health of state and local uh, economies, and uh, is that uh, something that you're worried about? State and local yes. government uh, economies, I should say. Uh, thank you, Tom. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, uh, so obviously, uh, you know, most state governments get their money off of corporate income tax and personal income tax, and to the extent you've got uh, people unemployed, lower incomes, lower bonuses, you're going to have uh, lower profits, you're going to have less revenue. And so every state I talk to is facing a lowered revenue situation, and they've got balanced budget amendments for the most part. And so, you know, they've got to fund it one way or the other. And so that will cause uh, cutbacks in staffing and services. Um, at least in my district, the cities may even get it harder. Many of our cities are dependent on tourism related taxes. Think hotels, rental cars. Um, uh, Richmond, for example, has a big restaurant tax. And a lot of these service businesses are no longer going to be, you know, good funders for city government uh, either. So I, I think you're going to see a lot of challenges in, in state and local governments. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I would say that we're just starting to see the pain in the state and city and local governments. They usually respond with a lag because they, they funded themselves through the couple of months of the initial pain. And now when revenues, I mean, it's an untenable proposition, right? Their revenue streams are going to be hit hard and their cost structures tend to rise in a downturn because they have to fuel, you know, public services, social safety nets, education, et cetera. People are pouring back into schools when they can't get jobs. So this is just a completely untenable position for them to be in. And what it means is that they'll have to make hard choices. And those hard choices are they're almost always the same. They do a combination of figuring out what they can tax a little bit more, how they can get the revenue streams up, and then cutting costs on things that are unpopular to cut back. But we have to tighten around, tighten in some way. So I think that the pain that you're going to see in states, localities is is down the pipe even worse than what we're seeing today. And certainly something I think we're all watching. Uh, carefully because it can be an important thing for how communities can respond and recover. And an important factor for labor market progress, obviously, because I, I think the data are that uh, state and local governments employ, what is it, one out of eight or so Americans, somewhere in that range. It's a, it's a surprising, right. uh, surprisingly large number of, of people. I've got a, an interesting question here. If you 
could only follow one economic statistic, what would it be? Wow. That goes against everything I've been taught to do. I have a whole book back here that says labor <laughs> uh, macroeconomic economic indicators. So one statistic it would be a fool's errand. But if you'd like if to I offer only a follow one, if yeah. I if I've been forced to, although I don't, I'm not going to ascribe to this as a good strategy. But it might be sentiment because while sentiment predicts nothing, it predicts everything. So if you ran a regression, you put sentiment in. People would say sentiment doesn't matter. But you can see that sentiment matters a lot. And if you start to feel the momentum either picking up or slowing by looking at these sentiment indices. And so if you only gave me one and I was supposed to intuit the rest of it, I'd probably look at sentiment. That's so interesting because I was going to say I was nervous about saying in front of a prominent labor economist, mine would be, I don't know whether it's unemployment or employment to population, but, you know, in the end, our mandate, you know, as critically what's happening with the labor market. And I think watching that closely probably skims out a bunch of other questions. You know, you can get underneath what real momentum looks like and a lot of other things based on what's happening in the labor market. I'm so glad to hear you say this is my proudest moment, Tom, in our conversations. Yeah. This proves that I do learn. <laughs> well, speaking of learning, uh, maybe I could stay with you for a moment, Tom. Among the, uh, the interesting trends, at least for an old economist like me, is that the number of really interesting new high-frequency data series that we can add to our surveillance. Uh, have you tied into those? Which ones do you find particularly interesting? Are there strengths and weaknesses of these alternative measures relative to the more traditional ones? Yeah, I, I, I quite like the fact that um, we've turned in this way. It's an exciting time to be in my job because, you know, the battleship is no longer moving like a battleship. It's moving, you know, real time. And I have to update my point of view on things every week, which is uh, strange. Um, I watch very closely, uh, you know, uh, credit card spend, uh, and I can get it by channel by day. Um, and I said credit card, it's credit and debit card, but it's card spend by channel by day. And during this downturn, you know, you can see it very clearly dropping in total. It was down in the high 20s by early April. Um, it was actually back to prior year a week and a half ago. And then in the last week and a half, it's dropped about five or six a percent below prior year. So I just think that's an unbelievably good metric for what I think in today's economy is the key thing, which is our consumer is going to return uh, to commerce at scale. And of course, within that, you can see the difference between, you know, online, which is up and bricks and mortar, which is down and, you know, debit, which is up and credit, which is down and, uh, you know, furniture stores and home and garden stores and grocery stores, which are up and you know, department stores and, you know, uh, hospitality and leisure, which is down. So you really get a pretty good feel for this critically part, you know, critical part of the economy. President Daly? I'm going to add to that because, it, you know, you can, you can really look deeper in those, in those data that you get. And what you can start to see is the number of trips people make, what they're purchasing, what the value spend is. And it's really interesting information because even if you see consumers going back, but their average spend is lower than it used to be, or they're, they're, they're just buying necessities. This gives us lines of sight into just how much pain and, and, and confidence there is, really, or is there pain or their confidence. So when people start buying lots of luxury goods and big ticket items and going a lot to the, to the markets, then you think, well, okay, we're getting momentum. But when they're going and they're buying cartfuls of necessities and they're going episodically, that tells you that we're not out of the woods yet on the uncertainty about the virus and what people think they need to do. So I think it's useful just for the volume of transactions, the dollar spend, and also the distribution of what that looks like so that we get lines of sight into the calculation of something like sentiment or momentum. We've had several questions come in that uh, point out that while we're dealing with a medical and an economic emergency, the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion have also been raised to a high level in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, economics is not a profession that is as diverse as it should be. Uh, the question is, uh, what can the Fed uh, do to promote uh, better outcomes in this uh, area? What is the Fed doing? And uh, perhaps, President Daly, we could, we could start with you. Sure. Well, you know, the Fed is, we live and work in the communities we serve, and our jobs are just like any other employer's jobs in terms of contributing to a more inclusive economy. And that is, you know, hot 
train, hire, coach, promote people who are, don't look like us. And that's no matter who we are, making sure that we have diverse voices at the table across the board, up and down our staffing ranks. I mean, I think all of us understand as economists and, and people who study economics that the policies we take are endogenous to the people who make them. You know, we spot the problems better when we have a diverse group then, and we can solve the problems more easily when we have a diverse group. So that's our first charge, is making sure that we're taking the vow not to just have optical diversity and just put people in our ranks, but actually work with those individuals to make sure their voices are heard, be an inclusive uh, listener, essentially. So that's one way we, we, we certainly can contribute to the issue or helping the issue. The other way, though, is thinking, and there are multiple ways, but another way is to be out in our communities talking about the importance of an inclusive economy. You know, I think that gets lost a lot of times. This is not just about fairness, although fairness is definitely important, equity is important. The other thing is we will grow faster if we have an inclusive economy. If we're not, we are leaving you know, talent on the table all over the place, either because we don't even have them engaged in the labor market or because they're not in the right positions because they never got an opportunity. And ensuring we're getting talent matched up with the opportunities correctly in our society, it changes our growth path from something that we don't like too much to something that we'd like a lot better. So I, I think that's another role the Fed can play is just the value proposition of inclusion. Excellent. I'll add a couple things. Uh, one, I feel honor bound to say, I think I'm still credible in this. I spent 30 years in the private sector. I worked with a hundred of the biggest companies uh, in the world. And when I arrived at the Fed, I found a much more diverse and much more inclusive environment than exists in the private sector. So I just think, you know, as we, we should normalize by starting uh, there. I think it's a much more sensitive environment. It's a much more open environment. Uh, in my world, I think probably Mary's every job is posted their real efforts being made, you know, across the uh, across the institution. I'd say that said, um, you should never be satisfied with where you are, and we're nowhere near where at least I would aspire for us to be. Um, uh, certainly in our shop, and I think in every shop in the Fed, we've used the opportunity in the last couple of months to open a set of conversations and try to create a much more inclusive uh, environment. At least in our bank, those conversations were. Uh, raw and unbelievably illuminating and really, really, really helpful, I think, to, to move the ball uh, forward. And I think we, we should acknowledge that, um, you know, I don't think the Fed is a uh, world-class development organization from a diversity standpoint. So there, uh, and I'm not saying that's all about the institution, though it's some about the institution. You know, we have 12 separate independent banks. We don't have a collective development effort at scale. Um, you know, when you, and I came from the outside, so I'll just say this, you know, when you hire someone from the outside, often it's because you didn't have someone on the inside. That's sort of how the world works. And we should always be working across the 12 banks and the board of governors to be making sure we have a big suite of candidates on the inside who are ready for every uh, potential um, vacancy and that they'll be a very diverse slate. And when your numbers are small, you know, you've got to work actually um, human by human to help them build the capabilities and to help them build the confidence to aspire for, for more. And I think that Mary and I collaborate quite a lot on that topic internally. But I think there's a lot still we can and should do. Um, but, but I will say it all comes from a place where we start, and again, I think I can say this still, um, you know, at a pretty advanced place. Excellent, well, uh, we could go on talking forever, but we've reached uh, the end of our hour together. Uh, wonderful, far-ranging and interesting uh, set of remarks. I'd like to thank you both, not just for your participation today, but by your, for your service uh, to the country and the Federal Reserve System. Uh, we hope all of you who have attended have found this uh, uh, fulfilling. Uh, there are other uh, lectures scheduled in the series, so don't forget to sign up for those. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Chris Jonas and thank everybody for their participation. Thank you, Carl, for having us here. Thank you very much, thank enjoyed you. it. Great, thank you, President Daly. President Barkin and Carl, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, next week we will have uh, Leo Bra Governor Leo Brainerd from the Federal Reserve Board. It will take place on Tuesday, July 14th at 2 p.m. Registration is available for NAVE members and the public on NAVE.com. Uh, as a reminder, all uh, recordings of past webinars are available through the NAVE Connect app, which can be downloaded through the app store. NAVE members can also access recordings through the NAVE.com digital archive. 
Okay, thank you all again. This does conclude the event. Today's program is copyright 2020 by the National Association for Business Economics with All Rights Reserved. We'll see you next time. Thank you.